going home. Do you believe that? I'm going to say it then. We are one day closer to going to home. How many believe that? Yes. Would you give the Lord a good amen? Amen, yeah. I believe it. He's returning soon. And are you ready is the main thing. I don't put that up there just to say it. Are you ready if the Lord was to return today? Because one day he is going to return. I don't know what time. I don't know where, where you'll be when he returns. But I will tell you he is returning again. And if you're not ready, you, meet, you need to make sure you're ready. And at the end of the service today, when I, when I say you're not ready, you must be born again. And if you're not born again, you must, I, I, I'm asking you, please see me after the service. I want to pray with you. I want to give you some things and uh, help you understand what it means to be saved. We believe in a, at Abundant Life Fellowship that the Bible, how many bring your Bibles today? Would you just hold them up? You have them. Praise God. Thank you. You need to bring your Bibles if you can because I want you to highlight in, in the Word of God. Some of you have these electronic Bibles on your iPhone and that's fine, but I'm just going to encourage you to get a hard copy. Here's why. There's going to come a day where those things aren't going to be on iPhone anymore because the Bible is, is fastly becoming offensive to a lot of people. Or what I'm, what, what I'm going to say, they may have it on an iPhone, but they're going to change it. The King James Bible is going to be taken out. They're going to change it, and they're only going to put things on there that do not offend anyone. And that's the issue. So you want to get yourself a hard copy of a good King James Bible, or I use a new King James. I go back and forth, King James, New King James, okay? But how many believe that the all-sufficiency uh, of the Bible is, is God's Word from Genesis 1-1? All the way through Revelation 22, 21. Do you believe that? All right. Would you stand and let's say the scripture together? All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is profitable for, read it with me, doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That is 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Are you hungry for the truth of God's word this morning? Do you want to hear the truth? Will you take it in today? Because you're going to need to, all right? Because if you're not hungry for the truth of God's word, this, this next hour that we're here is just going to be a waste of your time. But if you're hungry for the truth of God's word, you're going to get something out of it. Galatians 2.20 is the main verse this morning. I, I believe most of you know it. Some of you could quote it. The Apostle Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, the King James Bible says I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave me himself for me. But the main thing you understand is that you've been crucified with Christ. The, the title of this morning's message is Living the Crucified Life. Father, we thank you again for your holy word. And Lord, we thank you that we not only have your word, we have the Holy Spirit who leads and guides us in all the truth. And Lord, we ask today you would do that, that you would lead and guide us, that you would teach us, and you would help us to understand what it means to live the crucified life so that we may honor and glorify you each and every day in this very dark and corrupt world that we would shine brightly for your glory. Now, put your hand on your heart and repeat this prayer. Say, Dear Jesus, speak to my heart this morning. Open my eyes to see and open my ears to hear. And dear Jesus, change my heart today. Amen. You may be seated. We're talking about living holy and righteous in this very wicked world. And I realize that much of the church today, I should say most of the church today, is not preaching holiness and righteousness. And how many get that today? Uh, they're not really calling people. In fact, we've seen unrighteousness and iniquity come into church. And we talked about that during our Bible study this morning, that we we've ha we've now have homosexual pastors, and we have homosexual church members, transgender church members, and it's all being accepted, and things are being accepted into the church that, that God does not want in his church, all right? It's not to be part of the body of Christ. And the problem is, church has become a big entertaining business. 
I want you to take a look at this next picture up here. Thank you. You'll see a lot of churches look like this. And I'm going to tell you, folks, let's just be truly honest. That's not what God had in mind. All right, now, I don't have a problem with a large church, but I have a problem with how you have people way up there. It's, all, it's like a theater. You know, you see what I'm saying? You got these people up there on the top teaching, and you got people down below listening, and I'm wondering how much truth is getting in those people because I know when I was at Bible college, I remember a professor saying you've got to hear something ten times before it actually becomes part of you. You can hear something once, and it may be something dynamic, but after time you forget it because how many know our, our, our brains sometimes have holes in them, right? All right, I know, especially men. Men, my, men may, you know, my wife will say that the words go in one ear and go out the other, right? It is true that even the most intelligent person can only retain about 5 to 10% of something that he has heard or she has heard the first time. The more you hear it, the more it becomes part of you, okay? And that's why I repeat myself quite often here, not because I don't have something else to say. I want you to learn, amen, right? And I often refer to children, go to school. You, you have a, a, a teacher in a class, she's teaching her kids math one day, teaching them how to add. And then the next day, she, does, she doesn't just teach them how to subtract. And then the next day, teach them how to multiply and divide. They have to understand how to add and learn how to subtract before they can understand multiplication and division. How many understand that? So that's why a teacher repeats and goes over those, those, those problems on the board over and over and over and over and over again. Any teachers here? See, my mom was a teacher, okay? She taught school, and she, she would teach sometimes the same math lessons over and over and over until the, the, the students understood how to do it properly, right? Well, it's the same in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the church. Now, God never intended for a preacher or teacher to get up and teach a 45-minute or an hour lesson then send everybody home. That's not what the early church was about. I have studied about the early church in Acts chapter 2. If you can go to the next one. The Word of God says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, when you talk about the church, this is on the day of, right after the day of Pentecost when the church was birthed in Jerusalem, you will have the church meeting together. And the Word of God says, and they continued steadfastly. That means they got together, and the word steadfastly means they decisively dedicated themselves to the apostles' doctrine. That means the teachings of the apostle, the teachings that the disciples of Jesus got from him, and they passed it on to the congregation. They decisively dedicated themselves to the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They were one. They fellowshiped with one another. They ate with one another. They encouraged one another. They prayed for one another. Do you get it? And in the breaking of bread and prayers. So they were together a lot. That's what the church is supposed to be. And this is what the church looked like back in the day. This is kind of what it looked like. They were there together, and the, the, the apostles would teach until someone was, uh, you know, someone became more knowledgeable of God's word and felt the calling, then became a pastor. Then they would spread out and start a new congregation. And that was spread out and started a new congregation. But they were in a room together like this, and they weren't there for 45 minutes or an hour. They were there mostly all day long. And they would study God's word, and they would ask questions. Now, you know as well as I do, these big churches, nobody can stand up and ask a question. It's almost like these pastors are untouchable. I've been around some of these pastors. They walk around thinking they've they got bodyguards on both sides. That, to me, is just crazy. But the fact is, the early apostles, when they taught God's word, they answered questions, okay? They answered the questions that the people had. Now look at this next verse, Acts 2, 46 through 47. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So they went from house to house. They met together, did eat their meat with gladness and, sing, uh, 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 with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. Having favor with all people. You know why I believe they were having favor with all people? Because they were literally walking up and talking to people and loving them and showing the love of Christ. Amen. They, and they basically were the salt and the light of the earth that Jesus has called us to be. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Okay? Now this is what church should be. But the problem is today we have what I call a uh, glorified nightclub. Many churches have become a glorified nightclub. You go into a church, people, and people expect that now. 
They go into a church. They want a dynamic worship team. They want someone to get up there and really sing wonderful and play wonderful and have all the songs they like. And they want a preacher that's funny, tell some jokes and tell some stories. You know, basically, it's become a glorified nightclub. And friends, we don't want to be that because that's not what you see in the book of Acts. How many times do you, see, you, you read in the book of Acts Peter telling jokes? Come on. Now, I don't have a problem with someone t telling a, a good, uh, you know, a, 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 a very clean joke once in a while or even making a point. But how often do you see the early church entertaining? Come on. They were constantly teaching and educating. And this is what the church must be, education. If you can go to the next one. And this is what we want to be here at Abundant Life Fellowship. Because this is why we allow you to ask questions. Now, most churches won't do that because you take a risk. You don't know what's going to come out of someone's mouth. So, but if we hand you the microphone, we want you to be able to ask an honest question. I want you to learn. Right. This is what our church is about, learning. If you're not learning, then what are you here for? Right? right. right? right. If you're not learning God's word at church, then what good is it? If you have a question, imagine you see somebody in a big, large, mega church. You got Mr. John Christian, who's a brand new baby Christian sitting there, and the preacher's preaching on something he does not understand. He said, I have a question. Right. As if that preacher is going to stop and answer his question. And oh, he'll call up the church. Say, I had a question. And the church said, well, you can't talk to him. I'll talk to one of the other pastors. You know, that's not fellowshipping, folks. That's not being one. We want to be one in Christ. Amen? Amen. And I want you to learn. I want you to ask questions. This is why Ken does it in his Bible study. That's why we do it here on our Sunday morning service. That's why we do it on Wednesday night. So if you have a question, raise your hand, just like this lady here, and we're going to answer your question. And, it, and please, no question is a dumb question. No question is a dumb question. If it's a sincere question and you want to learn something, please ask it. So this morning we're talking about living the crucified life. Turn to your neighbor and say, live the crucified life. Amen. Now, before we go into the main message this morning, as always, we do something called reviewing. I review a lot because I want you to learn. Now, some of you, have, have, you weren't here last few Sundays, and, and I'll try to catch you up with what we have already talked about. Some of you have been here every Sunday, and you know what I'm talking about. But I want to talk about what we have learned over the past few Sundays. Now, we've been talking about biblical salvation. In the handout that I gave you, I, I told you there are two things that we were, we were doing here. And number one, um, let me make sure I got this right. Number one, I wanted you to understand what true biblical salvation is. Okay? You understand that? And... All right, how many have your handouts? All right. Do you notice on the handout, I told you there were, we were learning about what it means to be a born-again believer in Christ. Do you see that? And uh, I told you that if you are a born-again believer in Christ, and I'm trying to get to my, my, hand, my main slides here, sorry. Apologize, I didn't have it ready, but now I do. Okay. We have been learning about what it means to be born again. Now, I told you that if you are born again, you have been born from above. That's what it means, John 3, 3. You're born from above. That means you're going to have a transformed life. Does everybody understand that? There are a few things that are going to take place in your life. Number one, you're going to be, first and foremost, it's very important, you're going to be aware of sins, all right? You're going to be aware of what sin is. Now, a lot of people have an, an idea what sin is, but you're going to be really aware because the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sin. And he will lead you and guide you in all truth. Amen. And you'll know what God wants you to do when God does not want you to do. Amen, right? And the second thing, you're, you're also going to have a desire to study, learn, and obey God's word. You're going to have that desire. If you're born again, the, remember, as we're going to learn just again in a minute, the Holy Spirit does the work in you. Amen? All right? Okay? Thirdly, we talked about you will not have a desire to live in sin, but you will literally run from sin. Okay? And fourthly, you will not have anything to do with this wicked world. And we've been on that for quite a while. You won't have anything to do with it because you're not part of this wicked world. All right? Amen? Now, for months we've been talking about that. And there are things in this life that you and I 
can learn that will make little or no difference, okay? For example, at the end of your life, it isn't going to matter if you knew a lot about cars or airplanes or sports, okay? Come on, think about that. You may like sports. You may like, like golfing. Anybody play golf? All right. It, how, many here, how many here play golf? Okay. All right. Some, I, I can't. I, just, I don't like the game. I don't know why. Now, playing miniature golf, I may play some of that, but I just can't go out there and, and walk around on a golf course. Now, some guys love it. Some people, you know, they love uh, um, football or basketball and all that. Now, I, I like football. I watch football, but it's not that interesting to me anymore. But what I'm saying is there are things in our life that aren't going to make, um, make a whole lot of difference at the end of life if we knew about them or not, right? You get that, okay? But when it comes to salvation, when it comes to the subject of salvation, that will have a tremendous bearing on our lives. It will have a tremendous bearing on uh, not only on our, our behaviors, but on our ultimate desti destiny of, of where we're going to be. Do you get this at the end of our life? Where are we going? It's absolutely vital that we who are Christians know what is included in the salvation that Jesus Christ paid for us. Amen. All right? And this can only be determined, now get this, this can only be determined by learning what God's holy word, the Bible, says about salvation. Not what someone else says about salvation, but what God's word says about salvation. Now please listen. This is so important. God's holy word must be both our foundation and our guide. Did you get that down? I'm going to say that again. God's holy word must be both our foundation and our guide. I want you to take a look at this next slide. We talked about biblical salvation. We have learned that the Bible is the gospel, and the gospel is all about what? Salvation. salvation. Well, of course we know the Bible's true, but it's all about salvation. It's not about anything else. If you try to make it about anything else, you're going to open the door for false teaching. Do you get this down? It's all about salvation. I've had people say, well, you know, the, the shallow end of the pool, as we have this picture of the pool up there, that's salvation, and then you go on and on. No, it's all about salvation from start to finish. You see, the reason why there's so many lies and deceptions that come into the church is because we're looking for something that has nothing to do with your salvation. All right? For example, you go back in the book. Why did God inspire there to be all these books to be written? 66 books. Why are, what they're about. They all point to who? Tell me. Who do they point to? Jesus. What did Jesus come for? Tell me. Well, salvation. Luke 19, 10. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save what? The lost. Okay? I've come to seek and to save the lost. Then Jesus said in John 10, 10, he says, I have come that you also may have life and have it more abundantly. So what you see is salvation in those verses. Jesus came that we are saved and that we have his life, which is also part of our salvation. Do you get that? So in the Old Testament, we have everything pointing to Jesus. In the Gospels, we have the story about Jesus. And in the book of Acts, we have the church that proclaims Jesus. And in all the other books that are written by the apostles, John, Peter, Paul, James, all these, these, these books we have, helps us to walk with Jesus, and the book of Revelation is written so we know what's going to happen in the future. Amen. All right, you get that, okay? But it really all has to do with our salvation and especially our sanctifying uh, process that we're in because you've got to get the truth of God's word in to be sanctified. Am, am I making sense? Right. Are you with me? Okay. Now let's look at our biblical salvation. Go to the next one. All right, so here we go. We got the swimming pool. Next one, please. So you got the shallow end of the pool. This is when you are saved, which is justification by faith. We already studied that, right? We are justified by faith. Then you are being saved. Do you see that? All right. And then you are saved. There's, this is what the God, the, the, the God's word teaches us. We are saved by justification by faith. Then as we grow in the Lord, we're being sanctified. That's a progressive sanctification. And when the Lord returns for us at the rapture, we get our glorified bodies. All right? Now I'm going to do a little teaching on glorification here in a few weeks. But let's look at this. This is you. You're in the water. You saved today? Go to the next one. There you are. All right? You're a brand new baby Christian. Do you just come to the Lord and, 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 and believe on him? You repent of your sins. And uh, you ask the Lord to save you. Now you're saved. You just go home and do whatever you want. Is that right? No. What happens? You're to continue. 
And you've got to make an effort to continue in the things of God. Amen? So you're a baby Christian. You're learning. You're kind of out in the, in the shallow end of the pool. Just like a child. You can't put a child in the deep end of the pool if he doesn't know how to swim, right? All right? How many have ever been in those big public pools and you've got the shallow end for the kids, you've got the deep end for the more uh, experienced swimmers? Well, this is you. You're a baby Christian. And you're, little by little, you're saved but you're also being saved. And that's the thing you have to understand. You're being saved right now. What's that mean? Well, you're saved the moment you come to know Christ. That means you're saved from the penalty of sin. Now, as you go through life, as you get God's word in you, and as God's word's being taught to you by the Holy Spirit who indwells the believer, you are now being free from the power of sin. So you don't live in sin anymore. All right, you get that? And eventually, you're going to be saved from the presence of sin. When you get your glorified bodies, you will never, ever even be, sin will never affect you ever again. Do you understand this? All right, any questions? Here's your time. Any questions? Okay, so here you are. You're growing. You're going along. You're getting a little older in Christ. You're getting more mature. You're seeing the fruit of the Holy Spirit grow in you. And then eventually a little bit more. Go to the next one. You're a little further out. You're getting more into the deeper things of God. You're understanding the Word of God more and more because the Holy Spirit's teaching you. You have a more hunger for the truth of God's Word. And eventually one day you reach the end of your life and then you're going to get your glorified bodies at the rapture. Does everybody see that? All right, I hope I made some sense. All right. I hope you like my illustration there, okay? All right. All right. Now, but what about those who do not believe the truth? Go to the next one. What about the many false gospels? And we talk about it here quite often. What if you don't put your faith in Jesus, who is God in the flesh? You have false gospels. There is no justification because God will not honor someone's believing in a different Jesus. For instance, if you believe the Jesus of the Jehovah Witnesses, who is the Archangel Michael, you'll never be justified. Right? If you believe in the Jesus of Mormons, who was the brother of Satan, you will never be born again. You'll never be justified. If you believe the Jesus of some of these charismatics, like Bill Johnson, who teaches that Jesus was a man when he walked this earth, only a man, that is not the Jesus that will save you. Okay? Jesus has always been God. He never stopped being God. How many get that? You must know that Jesus is God. All right, he is fully God and fully man. So what happens to those who do not put their faith in the right Jesus or listen to a false gospel? Well, look what happens to them. All right, they're going to eventually sink. They're going to they're perish. They're going to perish. Do you see that? So we want to make sure we understand the true gospel. The true gospel is all about salvation. It's about justification. It's about sanctification. And eventually it's about glorification. If you can go to the next one, please. All right, so turn to your neighbor and say, beware of false gospels. And why? why? Before I put the next slide up there, why must we beware of false gospels? Why? What does false gospels result in? What do, what do they make? What do false gospels result in? False gospels. Remember, the Apostle Paul said, beware of anyone who comes preaching a different gospel. All right, because Paul taught the one true gospel. It's all about God's grace, right? Right, remember, through God's grace we are saved, right? Through faith, through Christ, amen. He, Paul said, let anyone teach us another gospel other than the gospel of grace. Let them be anathema, or let them be cursed. Okay, what's going to happen if you, if you believe a false gospel? False gospels produce this. Go to the next one. False gospels produce what? False converts. And this is what we have to be careful of. Because false gospel is not going to keep you in sanctification. If you don't have the right Jesus, if, you don't, if you're not justified, and the Holy Spirit doesn't indwell you, you're not going to grow in the Lord. You're just going to stay in your fleshly attitudes. And that's why a lot of these people that claim to be Christians are running after the false gospels that appeal to their flesh. Do you see that? Appeals to their flesh. Amen? Go to the next one. I like what Steve Lawson said. Steve Lawson said, In a counterfeit conversion, in a counterfeit conversion, there is no death to self, 
no submission to the Lordship of Christ, no taking up a cross, no obedience in following Christ, no fruit of repentance, only empty words, shallow feelings, and barren religious activities. And boy, is Mr. Lawson right. The true gospel is going to produce a change in your life. And those of you here who are born again, and some of you get up and testify, you will tell me, boy, has it made a difference in my life. Amen? Because the Holy Spirit does all the... See, here's the thing. You and I can't do nothing in our salvation. God does it all. You didn't get saved because you one day decided, I better get saved. Of course, you, you had to make that commitment. But you got saved because God called you. God justified you. God is now sanctifying you, and eventually he's going to glorify you. Do you understand that? You heard... God calling you, not in an audible way, but through his holy word, you realized you were a sinner and needed a savior. Therefore, you responded by faith. And that's the only way you're going to be saved, by faith. Amen? Right? Everybody with me so far? All right. So the, this is why we, we talked about this uh, last several uh, months, and we're still on it. The will of God is your sanctification. See, now that you're saved, you're saved when you come to repent of your sins, you believe on Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, you, you, you are now saved, you're now faithfully following him. What's going on now is the sanctification process. God is sanctifying you holy. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is sanctifying you holy. He's doing the work in you. Amen. Why? Why do we need to be sanctified? Because God's word says in Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. We've learned that, right? Well, I got news for you. You and I can't be holy. Not in of ourselves, because our holiness, our righteousness are as filthy rags. But God can make us holy. See, God's doing the saving, the sanctifying process. God can make us holy. God declares us holy. God declares us righteous. Now he sets us apart to live righteous for his glory. Amen. Okay? We live in a world that is under the power of who? Tell me. He's known as the God of this world. Amen? 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The Bible is very clear that Satan is the God of this world, and he's blinded the minds of many who receive not the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder, is there anyone here today you may have been blinded by Satan, and you're not receiving the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? Someone asked me once many, many years ago, said, how do I know if I've been blinded by Satan? You will know if you reject the truth of God's word and you refuse to repent of your sins and believe on Jesus Christ. When you say, no, I, I want Jesus, but I am not going to repent of my sins. I'm not going to do things that you know, I'm going to do things that I want to do. I don't care what God's word says. I want Jesus, but I want him in my own way. You are blinded by the God of this world. But if you hear the truth of God's word that calls you to repent of your sins, and you believe on Jesus Christ. When I say repent of your sins, you, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean you're going to repent of everything you've ever done your whole life? No. It means you understand you're a depraved sinner. See, how you repent of your sins is you understand you're a depraved sinner. And that Jesus Christ suffered on the cross for you. You see that? That's the very first thing that we must repent of is our unbelief our unbelief in what Jesus did for us on the cross. See, I now believe and I now know what he's done for me and now I know what I must do. So you'll know if you have truly been saved when you do not live for this world. Amen? Because the Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, the whole world is lying in the power of Satan, the devil. He's the God of this world. Look at this, 1 John 2, 15. We learned this. Just last, uh, last couple Sundays, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Or in other words, you don't have the fruit of love in you, you're not saved. Because all that's in the world, the Bible says, is what? First John uh, 2, verse 16, all that's in the world is the lust of the what? Flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is not of the Father. And the world is passing away. And the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God abideth forever. Now what is the will of God? The will of God is we repent of our sins. Believe on Jesus Christ. And become more and more like him. Romans 8.29 and Romans 8.30. 
Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he, the Father, foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. God wants you and I to be more and more like Jesus, and you can't be more and more like Jesus on your own. Only Christ can do that in you. Amen. That's why we must abide in him. Praise the Lord. Are you getting it? All right. This is a little bit of review before we go on. So you, you don't want to be reaching for the things of the world like this picture shows, like that big bear trap, okay? Because that's how the devil gets us. And why should we not live for this world? Because how many of you know as Christians we're just passing through? Amen. There is nothing in this world that's going to be compared to the things that God has prepared for his children. Amen. Look at this. 1 Peter 2.11. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers. We are aliens and strangers in this world because we don't belong to this world. To abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. In other words, what 1 Peter 2.11 is saying, we are sojourners. We are pilgrims in this life. We are strangers on this earth. We're a peculiar people. We're not citizens of this world anymore. Amen. The world is not my home. It's not your home. We're just passing through. Amen. All we have right now is we've been given a job to do, and that is to grow in Christ and proclaim the gospel. We have been given a job to do, and that is to honor God with the gifts and talents he has given us. So we have learned over the past several Sundays, and here it is, to live holy and righteous for God in Satan's unholy and sinful world. I've given you four so far. We're, we're going we're to review them. The first thing, and first and foremost, and very important, is number one, daily. Turn to your neighbor and say the word daily. Daily, daily know that it is God's will that we live holy and righteous in Satan's unholy and sinful world. Why is it God's will? Well, God's word says so. But probably one of the greatest examples of God's will that we live holy and righteous is Jesus praying out in the garden. I showed you that several times. And what did Jesus pray when he was in the garden? He prayed for who? Us. Read, have you read the prayer? Please read the prayer. John 17. Read it. He's praying for you and I. He loves us that much. And part of his prayer says this. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Keep them from the evil one. Sanctify them by the truth. Sanctify means to be set apart or to be made holy. And the only way you and I are going to be made holy is if we are born again and we're being sanctified by the truth of God's holy word. Amen. Number two, if you can go to the next one. The second thing we've learned is that daily do not allow Satan to influence you by his many lies and deceptions that he brings through his unholy and sinful world. We talked about that several Sundays ago. Do not allow the devil to influence you through those he has deceived. Now, once again, you've got all kinds of deceptions out there. How many get that? I mean, we talked about that for one Sunday. You've got deceptions in our government, all right? The laws that they create, they're anti-God, anti-Christ. We've got deceptions in our education system. We got deception in our entertainment system. Come on, think about it, folks. Think what's on television today. Come on, it's, it's filthy. Especially, uh, now you young people, I've said it before, you young people, you probably don't know any difference. But if you were raised back when I was a kid, when we had the old black and white TVs, and you watched things like Leave it to Beaver, and you know, Andy Griffith, and Father Knows Best, you know what I mean talking about? Those shows were clean. There was nothing on TV that was be considered vulgar, but not anymore. Everything's got to be filthy. You know why it's got to be filthy? Because that's what sells. That's what sells. See, advertisement knows that. The more filthy it is, the more it appeals to the flesh, the more they're going to be able to sell the, the, the sponsor's product. Come on. Are you getting it? That is a gauge of where our, our society is. We also have deceptions in religion, all the false religions and false doctrines that have come in the church. Are you, are you with me? All right? So we have to be careful that we don't allow the devil to influence us through his many ways of deception. Because look at the next one. Remember we talked about this. Where is Satan's target? Our mind. He gets to us through the mind. How does he get to us? Through his lies. And it doesn't matter who he's lying through. He can be lying through our government. He can be lying through an educator. He can be lying through an entertainer. He can be lying through a pastor. A false pastor, a false preacher, a teacher could be lying to you. That's why I told you, don't you believe what I'm telling you. You look at the scriptures and you look it up for yourself. Amen? Our only defense is God's word. Someone give me an amen, please. Amen. Number three, daily. Turn to your neighbor and say daily. 
Fill your mind with God's word so that you will be transformed. You will be transformed and be able to present yourself to serving God in true holiness and righteousness. We talked about this a few Sundays ago. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is the best example, but look at Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen? Amen. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, last Sunday, this is where we stopped off, and we'll pick it up from here. Daily, turn to your neighbor and say daily. Daily, make a willful choice to separate yourself from anyone or anything that is part of this wicked world system. We talked about 2 Corinthians chapter 6 last week. How many remember? Remember we talked about, come out from among them and be separate. God does not, he does not want us to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now once again, I'm not saying that we are to just, you know, be totally separated and not talk to anybody that's not saved. You, you still have to witness to them, right? We still have responsibility to witness to the unsaved. It just means we're not going to go along with their way of doing things, right? Does everybody get that? Same with your family. I, I told you last week, if you are saved and you are living for Christ, you're going to have unsaved family that's not going to like you. And I know that to be true. But that doesn't mean you treat your family like dirt. You still love them and you still witness to them, right? All right, does everybody get that? Okay, now that's all review. In the next half hour or so, we're going to take it up from here. Any questions on what we just reviewed? Does everybody understand it? All right. How many realize God wants us to live holy and righteous? All right? All right. All right, here we go. We're going to pick it up from here. And this is the last one. This is the last point. Now, I want you to know that Watchman Nee said this, and this is very important. Separation to God... Separation from the world is the first principle of Christian living. That's one of the first things that we do. And that's why, in order to do that, we must do those four things that I just, those four points I just talked about. Now, this morning, to go to the next one, we're going to talk about living the crucified life because this is where it all leads to. You know Christ wants you to live holy. He has be prayed that we would. You know that we are to, to not allow the world to influence us, right? You don't, you're, gonna hang, you're not going to listen to lies. You, you know that we are to get the word of God in us. You're going to be studying words of God, replace our old way of thinking with God's word. You know that we are to separate ourselves from the world. Now, what are we to do with all that? We have those four things. Now we are to walk in the spirit living what we call the crucified life. Now, that sounds a, a little like, uh, what do you mean, crucified life? The Bible tells us we are to. Let's look at that. Go to the next one. Are you ready? To live holy and righteous for God in Satan's unholy and sinful world. Everybody say daily. Daily live the crucified life by knowing and seeing yourself as being dead to sin and alive to live for Christ as you live in this wicked world. You've got to see yourself as being totally dead to sin. You almost, got, you almost got to see yourself as you're with Christ now. Because in God's eyes, he sees the finished product. He knows what you're going to become. Do you get that? Right? He's not guessing. He's not guessing if, if you are going to make it or not. He knows you are because the good work that he has started in you, he will complete. Amen? Do you get that? He knows what the finished product's going to look like. So you've got to understand, I know that God, Christ is going to finish his work in me. All right? That's why the Bible says we are to fix our eyes. Romans 12, 2, fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author in the what? Finisher, or that means perfecter of our faith. He's going to perfect us. Praise the Lord. Amen? All right, let's look at our verse we started with. Okay? Well, let's look at this one first. Luke 9, 23. This is a, a passage I want to throw in for free. Jesus said, and he said to them all. Now, in this situation, you had a lot of people coming to Jesus. They wanted things from him. Jesus got a little upset because everywhere he went, people crowded around. They wanted either to receive a blessing or to watch a miracle. Jesus was the greatest show on earth during that time. People didn't come to follow him. They didn't want to learn from him. They wanted to see him do something. So he turned and said to them, if any man... Anyone, come after me. That means if you're going to follow after me, what are you coming to me for? Let him what? Deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
That is not an option, folks. If we are going to come to Jesus, we can't say, Jesus, just save me from my sins. Then when you do, I'm going to go and do what I please. No. You're, you're, you're not even going to get in the shallow end of the pool. Because, see, in order to get in the shallow end of the pool, you've got to repent of your sins. Right? And sins are not just the things that we do. Sins are also things that we don't do. Like serving the Lord. Like, you know, I can tell you there are things that Jesus told us that we are to do. And Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. One of the things Jesus told us to do, we are to love our neighbors. Come on. All right. Love our neighbors as ourselves, right? All right. That we are to what? We are to put ourselves last, put others first before us. Amen, right? See, and this is what I'm talking about. So Jesus said, if you're going to come to me for salvation, you better be willing to follow me as my disciple. All right, you get that? Now let's look at that verse, Galatians 2.20. Notice what Paul writes. Everybody read it with me. I have been crucified with Christ. Notice it says been. Not that I'm being crucified with Christ. Because Christ paid the price once and for all, right? Amen. And once you put your faith in him, as we're going to learn, you have been crucified with him because you're in union with him. You are part of him. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But it's Christ who lives in me now. And the life which I now live in this flesh, this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see that? Paul is saying, now that I am saved, now that I am born again, the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. He loved me and gave himself for me. Can you say that today? Can you say that today? Well, if you're born again, you better believe you can say it. What, what makes you and I any different than the Apostle Paul? Come on. He's, he was just as much born again as you and I were. Come on. Right? Do you understand that today? God wants you and I to be able to say this. In fact, that's what we must say in order to live the kind of life that honors God, that I am now crucified with Christ. Now, let's look at that. To live the crucified life, number one, everybody say number one. You must know that the moment you repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, you are dead to your old sinful self. The moment you got saved, you are dead to your old sinful self. Therefore, so live like you're dead to sin. Do you see that? Live like you're dead to sin. You can do it because you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Does everybody get this? Yes. See, you, you, you do, you, 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 here's the thing. As a, a new Christian, the first thing that you, you learn as a baby Christian, you may not have a clue what's in, uh, in, the, in the book of John or the book of Revelation, but there's one thing you do know. You know that God doesn't want you to go back into the world. Amen. You don't want to allow your old way of doing, your old way of thinking to, to cause you to go back into the world. That's one of the first things that I remember as a baby Christian. I said, I don't want to live like that anymore. I don't want to listen to the world's music. I don't want to watch the world's movies. I took an, out three or four big, huge boxes and, uh, of 8-track tapes. How many remember 8-tracks? That I had received through the Columbia House uh, uh, <laughs> what do they call it, the 8-track club, or you know, where you, you get so many every month. And, and I mean, I had them all. I had all these eight tracks of every kind of group. Kiss, you know, um, Black Sabbath, you know, some of the big time rock groups. And I just threw them, Teresa, I was going to take them to the, like a, a, a thrift store and give it to them. And Teresa said, no, you got to burn them. You got to burn them because they're, they're, they're evil. So we took them out to a dump, a little town that we lived in. And there was a fire burning in the dump and we threw them down in and watched them burn. You know, the first thing that we do is we, we say it's time to separate myself from the world. That's one of the things God does. He separates us. He calls us out. He calls, he says, you're holy now. And you know, he's calling you out to be holy. Amen, right? So let's, let's look at that. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with who? Christ. All right, do you see that? I have been crucified with Christ. Now, what does this mean? Well, let's look at Galatians 5.24. This is what it means. Galatians 5.24. And those who are What? Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Do you notice the word have? It doesn't say will, and those who are Christ will crucify the flesh. It doesn't say they are to crucify the flesh. It says they what? Have, past tense. 
Okay, you have, because the moment you said yes to Jesus and you repented of your sins, you have crucified, okay, the flesh with his passions and desires. That means you have put, you, Jesus is now Savior, all right? Do you see that? Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to fall back in and live according to your flesh. You're going to have a struggle there, right? Until we get our glorified bodies, there's going to be a struggle between the spirit and the flesh. How many know what I'm talking about? I mean, think about what Apostle Paul wrote, remember? He said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I should do, I don't do. Oh, wretched man that I am, right? That's us. I still struggle in this body, and I will until I get my glorified body. But the fact is, I have been crucified with Christ, and that's the thing that gets... I can't do it, but God did it already. Therefore, I'm a brand new person, and I must see myself as a brand new person, and so should you if you're born again. Amen? Does everybody get this so far? Now, look at this. And those who are Christ, let's go back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And those who are Christ, okay, there we go. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And those who are Christ have what? Crucify the flesh with his passions and desires. Do you see that? Those who are born again live a crucified life. Get that down. Right, I want to write that down. Those who are born again live a crucified life. Although our flesh has been crucified, because God sees us as crucified. He sees us as dead. Our old man is dead and, and a new man has come. Why? Because we are born again. If you weren't born again, you'd still be your old person. But God sees us as born again, his child. So our old man has been crucified. Amen, right? Although there's still a battle in this life with our sinful flesh. Now, let's look at Romans chapter 6. Look at this. This is why Paul writes, Romans 6, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Here's the thing. We are under God's grace. Praise God. Amen? How many are glad you have God's grace? That means God's unmerited favor is upon you. You can't earn it. You cannot merit it. You, you can't pay for it. God loves you that much that because of his grace, he went to the cross. He went to the cross and suffered for you. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Now, that is something that you should have in mind all the time, that we are not deserving. No matter, first of all, we are not to think highly of ourselves. The more you walk with Christ, the more humble you should become. Amen? Amen. I don't care how good looking you are or how talented you are or how rich or poor you are. It doesn't matter in God's eyes. None of us deserve God's grace. But because of his grace and mercy, Christ died for us. And that right there, friends, should do everything in your life. That should right there say, man, that's why I want to follow Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. Because our sins have been paid for. Amen? Amen. It paid for once and all. Paid all. Past, present, and future. Isn't that wonderful? Now, that doesn't mean if you, if you fall into sin, you're not to repent and say, God, I'm sorry, I messed up. You should do that. But all of our sins, the moment you're born again, have been forgiven, past, present, and future. Do you see that? Okay? It's not like God one day is going to, oh, you're saved today, but if you really mess up, I'm going to scratch your name out of my book of life. No. If you're saved, you're sealed. Amen. Does everybody understand that? All right? You're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and God's going to work in you. He's working in you. Now, once again, you have to understand that you still can turn and go back into sin. But if you're born again, you will not. You will not. You may fall into sin. You won't live in sin. Praise the Lord. We've already talked about that. So let's look at this again. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What does Paul say? God forbid or certainly not. Look what he says. How shall we who died to sin live in any longer in it? How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? When did we die to sin? When you accepted Christ as your Savior. You've been crucified with Christ. Your old man died. That's what baptism represents, folks. Do you understand baptism? When you go in that water, you're not being washed of your sins. That's just basically an outward um, symbol of what Christ has already done inwardly. That your old man goes down in the water, and when you come up, you're a brand new person. All right? So you and I died to sin the moment we got saved. Now look at verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized in Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Amen. 
So we are in unity with Christ, all right? We have been baptized into his death. Look at verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, read it with me, even so we also should what? Walk in what kind of life? Newness of life. That we should walk in newness of life, and we can. Once again, it's not because of your power. It's because of the Holy Spirit power in you. Amen. And that's what's going to take place if you're born again. You're going to see a newness of life. The old man is going to be dying and keep dying, and the new man is going to keep growing in the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to see the characteristics of Christ growing in you through the nine fruit. Amen. Look at Romans 6, 11, and 12. Likewise, now look at this. Likewise, you, everybody say you, also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to what? Sin. To sin, but alive to who? A God. Life to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Now, the word reckon, I, I, I guess Paul must have been a southern boy. He said, I reckon so. Um, the word reckon here is only used three times in all of the New Testament. Three times. And get this, it, it, it's the Greek word logizomoia. It's the Greek word logizomoia, and it means to conclude or to estimate yourself. It means to conclude yourself as dead, that I am dead to sin. It means to come to that conclusion, amen. Or to fully estimate yourself as being dead to sin. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Now look at verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should be, obey its lusts. Well, come on. How, how can I do that? Because of the Holy Spirit. See, when you got people questioning, I can't do that. I'm going to continue to sin. Then I wonder if you're even saved. Because I don't have a desire to sin. I don't have a desire to to live for the lust of this flesh. Now, I can fall into it. I can get angry and say things I shouldn't have said. Right? Come on. I can have a bad day and do things I shouldn't have done. But I'm not going to live in it. Amen. That's what he said. Do not what? Let sin reign. Reign means you're going to continue to allow it to reign in your life. Amen. You won't do it because you're born again. Amen. You're not going to obey its lust because you see... Here, God sees us as justified, just as if we what? Never sin. God sees us as sinless. So we must see ourselves dead to sin and alive to Jesus so that we will not yield to sin, but instead completely yield ourselves to God. Amen. See, one thing the devil's going to do to you, folks, and he does it to me, he's going to say, oh, you, God can't truly love you. You're still a bad person. You're, you're still a person that's got problems. You're probably not even saved. Come on. The devil will come at your mind like that. You say, God can't use somebody like you. And that's when you've got to say, no, I am saved. And I am sanctified. And I'm not going to listen to lie because I see myself as forgiven. I see myself in Christ as I am dead to sin. Amen. Our position before God right now is we are dead to sin. Right? Amen. Now, conditionally, we are not. Positionally, we are dead to sin. Conditionally, we are not. We will never be totally dead to sin until we get our glorified bodies. Then we cannot sin. That's what's so, so wonderful about our glorified bodies when we get them. And I'm going to do a whole teaching on that, hopefully next Sunday. That when we get our glorified bodies, we'll have the same bodies that Jesus walks in now that cannot even think about sinning, alone sinning. Isn't that wonderful? Because in the new glorified bodies, you're going to have a brand new brain. That's why the Bible says when we see, 1 John 3, 2, when we see Jesus, when we look upon him, we'll be just like him. Amen? Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. So we're still going to have the problem with sin. We're going to deal with it just like Paul wrote about in Romans 7, 14 through 21. Now look at this. J.C. Ryle said it this way. The true Christian hates sin, flees from it, fights against it, considers it his greatest plague, resents the burden of its presence, mourns when he falls under its influence, and longs to be completely delivered from it. If you are born again, that's you. Amen. How many say that's me? Praise the Lord. Because look at 1 Corinthians 6. We've got to go quickly. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and following. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? What are we talking about? We're talking about being righteous and holy. Amen? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I think that's pretty plain, isn't it? It's pretty clear. That's the bad news. But look at the good news. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you. There was a time you lived like that. But you were what? Washed. But you were what? Sanctified, which is going on right now, the sanctifying process. But you were what? Justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. For such were some of you. Before you were saved, yes, that's how we lived. But now that we are saved, we come out of that lifestyle because we know it dishonors God. All right, amen? Did you ever see that? The Holy Spirit does the work in us. See, that's what, that's what changes everything. That's, that's, that, that changes the whole ballgame because I know I can't do it, but he does it. He's doing it in us. He does the saving from start to finish. Amen, right? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. A true Christian desires to be free from sin, not to sin freely. Amen. All right. So we learned the first thing to live the crucified life. The first thing, you must know that the moment you repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, you are dead to your old sinful self. God declares you dead to your own sinful self, right? So live like you're dead to your old self, sinful self. Number two. Everybody say number two. As we merrily roll along. Number two, to live the crucified life, you must also know that the moment you got saved, you became a brand new man or woman who is now alive in Christ. Amen. Instantaneously, you became a brand new man or woman. So act like you're alive in Christ. Amen. When I was first saved, I remember picking up an Imperials album. Anybody know who the Imperials are? And one of the songs I loved, now it wasn't one of their hits, but it was a song I loved because it was my testimony. And it was called The New Man. And the, the, the song goes something like this, take a good look at what you see. Not you, maybe you'll notice a difference in me. Once an old man with my heart out of place, now I'm a new man made by his love and his grace. Somebody new. That's what the song is somebody new. Somebody new lives in me. Somebody new lives in me. Do you get it? Somebody new lives in me. Amen. Praise, praise God. Yeah, give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. Somebody new. Thank God somebody new lives in us. Amen. Because if not, we wouldn't be saved. Let's go back and look at our passage, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. Yes, we learned that. It is no longer I who live. We learned that. But look at the next part. But Christ what? Christ lives in us. Christ lives in us. Now let's look at this. Romans 6.13 and 14. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being what? Say it with me. Alive from the dead. Present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. That means you make a willful choice, present yourselves as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So use your body to do what is right. That's what instruments means, your, your body parts, right? You get that? For, verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you anymore. You can't say, you know, I, I remember back in the day, there used to be a, a comedy show called Flip Wilson Show. And Flip Wilson would say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ger Ger what was her name? Geraldine. Geraldine. You, and, and the devil made me do it. And uh, you can't say that anymore. The devil can't make you do anything. He never has anyway. He can tempt you, but he can never make you do anything. But even now, even though you, you may be tempted, you're not going to have that desire because sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit in you. All right? You're not going to want to. That's it. For you are not under law, but under what? Grace. Now look at Ephesians 4, 24 and 25. This is a very important verse. This is how we do it. Therefore, you put off concerning your former conduct. You put off. You know, Paul's here and he's talking about that we continually, daily take off the old man. We're learning. It's not an overnight thing, folks. Come on. If I showed you my Christian life back in 1980, I was three years old in the Lord, I was still struggling, still had issues, problems. Had, you know, backslide a few times. But 
you're learning, you're growing, and you're constantly taking off and putting on. You're constantly taking off. You're taking off the old man, putting on the new. And I'm talking about in conduct. Amen. See, God sees you as already complete. All right? The old man, put off the old man, the former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. All right? Do you see that? Verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We talked about that a few Sundays ago, remember? That we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we're being renewed in the spirit of our mind. Our minds are being changed. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is teaching us, leading us, and guiding us in the truth of God's word. And the more that truth gets in us, the more we put off the old man and we put on the new man. Does it make sense? All right? And that's what's so wonderful about God's word. There's power in, in God's word. Amen. Those are the living word of God. You're holding your hand. That's the living word of God. That's a powerful. It's powerful. It's very powerful. And that you put on the what? New man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. There it is. See, God's already declared you and I true righteous and true holy. God's already declared you that. Now you and I are putting it on ourselves. We are becoming that. Amen. Amen? Amen. Finally, number three, to live the crucified life. Well, the, number two, um, let me rephrase number two. To live the crucified life, you must also know that the moment you got saved, you became a brand new man or woman who is now alive in Christ, right? You understand that? You're a brand new person. Turn your neighbor's I'm a brand new man or a brand new woman. So act like it. Now, I apologize. Number three, and then we'll take communion. Daily, yield yourself to the indwelling Holy Spirit by learning, knowing, and obeying God's word to live holy and righteous. All right. Daily, yield yourself to the indwelling Holy Spirit or the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit by learning, knowing, and obeying God's word to live holy and righteous. Allow God to work his good pleasure in you. Allow God to work his good pleasure in you. Friend, hear me. If you are a born-again believer, you're going to want to study God's Word. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit gives you that desire. You, now, that doesn't mean you're going to be in it 24-7. I know sometimes you work and you got busy days and, and, and you come home, you're tired. But you're going to find time to study God's Word on your own. And you need to. Don't just hear God's Word on Sunday when you come to church. Get into God's Word and study it, especially the New Testament. Amen? And I always tell people, get in the book of John. The Gospel of John is a good place to start. And also, I, I also encourage you to study like uh, the book of Romans, you know, one of, the, one of the epistles. But study God's word. Romans is a very good one. And meditate on God's word. And ask yourself, every time you read a passage, say, is this relating to me? And if so, what do I need to do about it? Amen. Now, I'm going to do a, a series of messages. This is kind of a... Uh, a shameless plug for it, but I'm going to do a, a series of messages very soon called The Fractured Fables That, yeah, <laughs> fractured, fractured Fables That Confuse and Condemn Christians, things that we believe that are not in the Bible. So that's why we want to get in the Word of God and study it and make sure that, that what is written there pertains to us, right? There are things in the Word of God that don't pertain to us, right? Amen? But we want to study things that do pertain to us. Praise the Lord. So we want to allow God to work in us. Now here it is. Everybody go to, let's look at Galatians 2.20 again. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Amen. In the life which I now live in the flesh or in this body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who what? Loved me and gave himself for me. Now look at that. The life I now live, the daily life that I now live, I live by faith. Now what is faith? What, faith in what? Faith in what? Faith in the God's word, truth. I, I, I put my trust in Jesus. See, it's not enough to believe in Jesus. Okay? A lot of people believe in Jesus aren't saved. You must believe Jesus. See the difference? Right. Believing in him and believing him are two different things. You, now you believe him. That's his word. Now you say, I want to hear and know and understand and obey his word. I believe him. And the Holy Spirit helps us do that because if we do, we'll live by faith. Faith, faith in the truth of God's word, and we know that he loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. So the born-again believer in Christ fully understands and appreciates, how many of you fully understand and appreciate what Christ has done for you on the cross? Amen. That is the game changer. When I fully come to that place understood that he suffered on the cross for me, I was not about to go back to the world and tell Christ to take a hike. 
A lot of people do. But I want, once I accepted him as my Savior, I want to serve him. Amen. How about you? This appreciation motivates us as believers to live a life of obedience. Amen. The false convert does not have this kind of obedience and appreciation. Why? Because they often look to Jesus to give me more, give me more, give me more. But the true convert says, Jesus, what can I do now? I want to serve you. Help me serve you more, serve you more, serve you more. Not get, 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 but to serve, serve, serve. Do you get? Because Jesus has done everything by dying on the cross. Amen? And suffering for us. Praise the Lord. Now look at this. Philippians 2. 12 and 13. This is a passage of scripture that's often taken out of context or not fully understood, but this bears the point. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out. Look what it says. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Do you see that? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, is that saying we have to work for our salvation? Does it say we have to work for our salvation? All right, no, why? You and I cannot work for our salvation, all right? We cannot, not in a billion years can we work for our salvation, and that's not what Paul writes here anyway. He writes, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, okay? We cannot work out something that is, uh, that is not all, that's not already in us. See, we already have salvation. We have the salvation in us, so we have to work the salvation that's in us out. Do you understand what that means? How many know what it means? Now understand this. This is very powerful. Boy, this is powerful. All right? What is happening in the born-again believer is not that we believe. Like I said, we believe in Jesus, but we're believing him more and more. We're getting the truth is growing more and more in us. It's growing and growing, and it's becoming. It's like you're, you're, all of a sudden your mind is opened up to the truths of God's word. How many have that happened? What's going on? It's the Holy Spirit. Like scripture will jump off the page and just like, wow, what's going on? It's the Holy Spirit. You're believing the word of God. You're not just believing in a Jesus that died on the cross. Now you're believing him and his word. Amen. You ever get that? All right. So this is what, we, what it means. That w- means we take, at, we take him at his word and act accordingly. All right. We take him at his word and act according to his admonitions and promises. Now look at this. This means that the truth that you and I have in God's word... We're getting from God's word because the Holy Spirit is teaching us, right? What the Holy Spirit teaches us, we are to put to practice. Work out means put to practice that which we know is true. Amen. Right? You and I as believers are to work at being obedient to God's word. It is work. Come on. Right? We make a decisive decision to obey God's word. This is the pursuit of a lifestyle of obedience has everything to do with sanctification. Come on. God gives us the truth. God is sanctifying us. He wants us to act upon that. All right? How many get that today? We're pursuing a lifestyle of sanctification. In other words, we do what God's word says we are to do because we love him. Right? That's why the last part says, right? That we love him. All right? We work out. Look at this. And we do this out of a healthy fear. We, we do it because we have a healthy fear for God. For it is God who works in you both to will and do his good pleasure. Do you see that? For it's God who works in you both to will and do his good pleasure. Now, although you and I as born-again Christians are responsible to yield ourselves to study, learn, and obey God's word, it is actually the Lord who produces the good works in us. Boy, get that down. All right. Although we still have to yield ourselves to study, learn, and obey God's word, it is actually the Lord who produces the good works and the Holy Spirit fruit in our lives. And that's, isn't that powerful? Because it is God who energizes our desires and our actions. And I see it happening, growing in my life. How about you? God energizes our desires. It's like, you know, you get a, a, a little toy and you put batteries and turn it on. Boy, it goes. That's what God is doing to the Holy Spirit. He's energizing our desires. And you get have more and more of a desire to serve the Lord. Now, how many of you here today can give a testimony to that? That's me. Come on. Think about it. You have a greater desire to serve the Lord. What's going on? God is literally putting that in you, and because you have that desire, you're working out your salvation. If you go back to the last one, go back. If you go back, please. If you work out, you're working out your salvation, right? You're working out your salvation out of what? Fear and trembling. Now, that's something that is missing in the church. 
There's not a lot of respect. Fear doesn't mean you're scared to death of God. It just means you reverence, reverence him. You, 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 you give him the respect he deserves. Amen, right? You're working out your salvation. And trembling literally means that you know that he has the power to throw you into hell if he wanted to, right? But he won't because you're his child. Amen, all right? Amen. Therefore, look at this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There it is. There's your life. Are you a born-again believer? If so, if you are in Christ, right? You're in Christ. You're joined with him. You're abiding in him. John chapter 15 so clearly teaches that if we abide in Christ and his word abides in us, right? We're going to produce fruit. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. Are you a new creation? Yes. This is very important, folks. Are you a new creation? Do you see some change going on in your life? Yes. I want you to do this now. I want you to ask yourself this question. When did I first come to believe in Christ, repent of my sins, and ask Christ to be my Savior? I want you to think about that date right now. I want you to think about that date right now. Now, since that time, can you see how you have grown and you see that you have become a new creation? Can you see it? That's because the Holy Spirit's doing it. Now, for some people, it happens quicker because, once again, you still have to yield yourself to obeying God's word. Amen? You still have to study God's word. And you can get lazy. Just because we're a brand new creation doesn't mean we're going to you still have to yield and do what God wants. Amen? Right? Amen? All right. Any questions? Any questions? Yep. If you go to the last one, please. Yes, sir. This is very important to understand this. Once again, we want to live the, the life that... Uh, please, there's your question. Is your mic. Uh, can, we, can we look at Hebrews 12, 2 real quick? Hebrews 12, 2. All right, let's look at Hebrews 12, 2. This is how, actually, Paul's giving us a word of encouragement how we can do this as well. But it's very important. I'll wait till everybody's turn there. All right, Hebrews 12. Everybody, everybody at Hebrews 12? 12 All right, 12, 2. All right, go ahead. We actually begin with verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does, does easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. See, that's how we look to, look to him, yeah. what he's done. Right. It says here, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, at the throne of God. For consider him, who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Right. Word of God says we are to know that we are surrounded by a lot of people that have gone the way of the cross. Christians that have suffered and have gone through tough times in life but still remain faithful. Now, if God can do it in them, he can do it in us. Amen. All right. Remember again, it's all about Christ doing the work in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? If you don't understand that, friend, you, you, you can't make yourself be good. You can't, but only God can. He's going to do it. Because see, our sinful, depraved, uh, unregenerated flesh is never going to obey God unless we're indwelt by God. We must be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that's why you must be born again now. Yes, we have a question in the back. If you can pass the microphone back here. Thank you. Okay, comment. It's just a comment of what Ken just read there. We start out with Jesus, but we have to continue to run the race. Right, right. Because if you don't finish. Well, that's the good news, is that you are, you're going to finish. A yes. true believer is going to finish. Yes, but you've got to keep following yeah, him and yeah. obeying him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
um, we, we, we see, when that, that verse really speaks, of, uh, speaks to us that we see the finish line. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He who began a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He will complete it. All right? He's going to finish it. You, God is molding you, and he's making you. And the finished product. Now think about this. The finished product of who you are will never be fully seen. God sees it because he sees everything. Will never be fully seen until you get your glorified bodies. That is the finished work. And that's going to be a time that you and I can't even come close to describing. I can't even come close to describing what it's going to be like when we are with Christ in our glorified bodies. But in this time, we must see ourselves as being with Christ. Imagine, Jesus is with us. He is helping us. He's, he's for us. So therefore, don't allow anything in this life to deter you away from him. Amen? Amen. Don't allow anything. Serve him with all your heart. Serve him with all your mind because you love him. Praise God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, please. No one looking around. And I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready to come as we get ready to take communion. But this is very important. I apologize. I want very quick to try to get through all this. I kind of piled it on quick and deep. Um, but you must understand that unless you are born again, you can't do any of these five points that I told you. You're, you're never going to get to first base with God. You must be born again. And all that means to be born again is you're born from above. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you are born into the family of God. Because when you and I were born into this life, we were born into the family of sin, Adam's sin. But because of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, you and I have the opportunity to be born into God's family. That's what it means to be born again. And the only way you can be born again, my friend, you can't earn it. I've said that many times. You cannot go to church enough. You cannot pray enough. You cannot give enough. You must put your faith in the finished work of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for your sins. Please hear me. As we're about to take communion, we're talking about the cross. You must put your faith in what Christ did on the cross. What did he do? He suffered and took the penalty for your sins. He took God's penalty. God literally poured out his wrath on Jesus who was totally sinless. The guilty party is you and I. We should have been the ones punished. But Christ took our punishment. Why? Because he loves us. Now, what are you going to do with that love right now? This love that's being offered. You can just say, no, I don't want it because I'm not about to repent of my sins. I'm going to live in my sins. That means you're rejecting the only hope you will have for eternal salvation. And if you do that, you will hate yourself through all eternity. Please, no one looking around. Please, this is so important. If you reject this great gift, you will go through eternity hating yourself. Because Jesus is the only way. But if you would but today see your sinfulness. And that God cannot and will not allow anyone into his heaven. Who is an unforgiven sinner. And you would be sorry for your sin. Know that you have grieved a thrice holy God. And ask him to forgive you from your heart. Because if it's real repentance, God will honor that. And he will then indwell you by the power of the Holy Spirit and help you from this day forth. But if you're just doing it to get a free ticket to heaven, God's not going to honor that. He knows your heart. He knows if you're sincere or not. Do you want Jesus or not? That's the question. If you are not born again and you have not given your heart to Jesus, I ask that you refrain from taking Holy Communion today and see Ken and I after the service and we will pray with you. We'll give you some materials 
and we will help you to understand what you must do next to be born again. Amen? Okay? Does everybody understand that? All right. You must be born again. With that, I'm going to ask the ushers to come.